If you haven't heard of the Sap Sapsucker, Sapsucker Birch, Strip, Birch Strip Company, then you must be uh, hiding under some sort of rock. Um, I am co-owner in the largest commercial Birch Strip enterprise in the Northwest Territories. <laughs> it is also the smallest Birch Strip producing uh, company in the Northwest Territories. It's the only one. Uh, with my partner Craig Scott, we tap about 400 trees and make about 40 gallons of syrup a year. This is a stage shot. Um, I had a hard time collecting pennies, but it's meant to illustrate the fact that uh, if you, if you want to make birch syrup, you better love something other than money. Um, the, uh, the next slide is going to illustrate this principle perfectly. It's, uh, it's taken from a, uh, the classic supply and demand curve uh, from e Economics 101. Uh, and there's an inverse uh, relationship between profitability and fun. So the more money you make, the less fun you have. So I've taken this principle and, and, <laughs> and applied it to, uh, to hiring more crew. In 2016, we had uh, the most crew we've ever had on staff, and it was the most fun we've ever had. Uh, we all have birch names, kind of like the Snow King. Why? Well, because it's fun. Um, Birka Beaner means birch legs. It's a ski race, and she's a great skier. Birch Buster is a, a Japanese woofer who loved chopping wood. Birch Monkey, I don't know where he got the name, but Dwayne Vogelmuth is deadly. And Birch Bud, we don't have a picture for him, but you get the reason why he's called Birch Bud. Um, <laughs> The Duke of Birch is uh, the co-founder co and the partner in the business, uh, Craig Scott. Um, and I'm not so immodest to call myself King. It was a name that's actually uh, given by uh, kids and, and teachers from Kalamadeni School as Kawo uh, Ki, which sort of like Birch Chief. Uh, and so that became Birch King, and I got a crown. And uh, George, he didn't want a Birch name, but he's awesome. Um, <coughs> we love Birching because we love the mainland. We live on Jolliff Island, and by a freak coincidence, Great sleigh breakup and birch season coincide. So we race off the ice just in time to, uh, to, to get set up at our birch camp. And so some years we move by skidoo and some years we move by, uh, by, by truck. But in that case, um, in, in all cases, we're, we're setting up a nice little homestead like this in this 12 by 14 wall tent. Cribs have become hammocks now for kids, but we're still nestled uh, at birch camp with creature comforts like baths and flush toilets and, and everything, everything that you'd want living out on the land. Um, Obviously, this picture has nothing to do with birch. Um, it's meant to illustrate the concept of cultural landscape. So cultural landscapes are, are landscapes that are inhabited by people, and they affect one another. So in this case, uh, rice terraces in southern China shows the fact that, that a, an agricultural culture affects the landscape. Um, so the same thing happens around here with Aboriginal cultural landscapes. Uh, this is a picture of a Charlotte Sarcel um, tapping birch trees in Fort Resolution. And so you'll find examples of Aboriginal cultural landscape use in, culturally modified trees, trap lines, uh, uh, tents, teepee rings. Um, but you'll also find that not only do people modify the landscape, but the landscape modifies the people. And so where we tap trees um, is on what's geologically known as the, the um, duck hay fault line. Um, but to Yelena and Denny people, it's called the Gudzikwe, and loosely translates as Lion Rock. And it's a super special place. It's an interim land withdrawal spot, and uh, we're really fortunate to, to be able to use the place. Which reminds me that I ought to love the landlords. Um, <coughs> we take, take great pains to, to uh, thank Yell Knives Denny for letting us tap on land. We make sure that people know that we're, we're on there with permission of Yell Knives Denny. We submit a, a proposal and a report outlining sort of quid pro quos, um, including uh, school programs for all kids at uh, Calumet Denny and Katehui schools. It's not just uh, Yell Knives Denny kids that come out to the camp. We have about three to 400 kids from Yell Knife area schools that come out every year to learn about about tapping, about uh, the sort of mechanism of sap transport, traditional tapping techniques. We had kids from Kugluktuk who came once, and they didn't care a hoot about birch. They just wanted to climb trees, because <laughs> they'd never seen, never seen trees before. Um, we often hold an open house for the public. Um, it's free of charge. People enjoy birch coffee, birch tea, birch goodies, bannock on a stick with birch butter. Um, and, uh, and it's become sort of like a rite of spring for people around Yellowknife. So we get to share the, the love of the spot that we have. Um, I met these uh, maple syrup producers at Winterlude in Quebec, uh, in Ottawa, the other year. And I told them that I was a birch syrup maker. And they said, oh, too bad for you. They said, that stuff tastes terrible. And, uh, and it's true, just like 7-Up just like seven up, seven up is the uncola, birch is the unmaple. Um, and I have a sense that it's meant for more refined palates. Um, this also is a stage photo. But I know you're all wondering, what about love making on the land? And uh, though I'm not one to kiss and tell, when we, de we decided to call our son after the spot where he was made, um, we almost called him Bryson, because we were house-sitting Barb's house. Uh, 
He is not called Birch Stand Mitchell, he's called Jolliffe Mitchell. Um, <laughs> if there had been no babies made at the Birch Stand, there have been lots of babies there, though. <coughs> Other than the, the photo of the, the baby on the quad and the baby with the chainsaw, I think these illustrate really wholesome activities that, <laughs> that happen at Birch Camp. Um, and, and are all activities that include no electronics or, or, or mechanics, really. So it's a really special spot for the families. Um, I was going to call this one Love the Phonology, but people, were, I thought, might wonder, what's head size got to do with anything? So um, <laughs> phonology is sort of like seasonal changes, and we witness lots of them at Birch Camp. Here's Duane and Leanne and Emile huddled against the cold south wind coming up the, the Duck Hay fault line, and my daughter, two weeks later, dancing half naked on the same bench. There's literally, literally a parade of birds that come through Birch Camp at this time of year. It starts with gulls and, and ducks, mallards, uh, grebes, and then, you know, finally uh, little, little um, warblers. Some are coming through and some are nesting, and this was the male, a great horn that was keeping watch over, the, over mom and the chicks the other year that were, they were nesting in, the, in Goodsy Quay. Um, and of course, the seasonal changes of trees. I've come to love the science of birch. Um, birch are monoecious trees, so male and female sex organs. You can tell a birch to go screw itself, and it can. Um, <laughs> but also the, the aesthetics of birch. I love like the flush of lime green uh, leaves that crown the stand at, at a certain time of year, and, and I've really come to appreciate it. Is it all love? No. I hate a lot of stuff. I hate this slimy goo that comes out of the taps at the end of the season that's infected birch sap. It tastes terrible, and I've got to clean it, and I hate washing buckets. So if there's anyone here that has a penchant for cleaning, you know how I feel about hiring people versus, uh, versus making money, so come and see me at the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>